Ahoy there, and welcome ye to Tabletop Ferox. And in this episode, I be continuing my look into the second playtest packet from Project Black Flag. And once again, I will not be uh, doing the pirate thing for the whole video. Uh, it would just be silly after a while. I mean, let's be honest, it was silly uh, just for the intro. So yes, Project Black Flag, Playtest 2, Part 2 of 2. Now, in the previous video, Part 1 of 2, I took a look at the Playtest Fighter, and in this video, I will be taking a look at the Playtest Wizard, as well as, you know, the magic system, because that is related to the wizard, also known as a magic user. So if you have not seen the previous video, uh, you can watch it after this one. It really does not matter in which order you watch these two videos. So I guess let's get into that. The wizard's hit dice, skills, and saves remain the same, but they are now proficient in no weapons in addition to no armor and no tools. Which is a bold choice to make, but one that I kind of support. With the 5th edition cantrips being actually useful, there really isn't a need for the wizard to occasionally fire off a crossbow bolt anymore. Like back in 3rd edition, it was kind of a necessity for wizards to have weapon proficiencies because, you know, like a level 1 wizard would still have something they could do in combat after casting their one level 1 spell per day. And thematically, it actually does kind of make more sense for them to have no weapon proficiencies, because someone who's spending all of their time studying the ancient arcane arts is probably not also practicing with a handful of random weapons. Because remember, proficiency means you are good at using the weapon, so the idea of a wizard taking a break from studying all their spells to just practice staff fighting or going out and target shooting is a little weird. Like, if that's a thing your character does, if they're like a war wizard, then it makes sense, but just like, for every wizard, it's a little unusual. Of course, you know, the mechanics and theming of wizards do have something of a history of not really lining up. Their spellcasting remains the same, as in copied almost word for word from the SRD. So, uh, spells prepared, spells per day, a spell book, spell casting focus, arcane recovery, all that stuff is exactly the same as in 5th edition. The main difference being that instead of the wizard spell list, their spells are prepared from the arcane circle, which is a thing that, you know, I will explain later. Also, they've changed how ritual magic works, Kinda? So now, instead of spells that can be cast as rituals, spells either are or are not rituals. And I will explain more about that later, but for now the important thing is that wizards get additional rituals known slots for learning the rituals. And then at level 2 you get, uh, Gasp, a new ability. Kinda. Magic Sense allows you to, as an action, detect the presence of creatures with the ability to cast spells, magic items, or ongoing spell effects within 30 feet. So, it is basically detect magic as a spell-like ability, usable a number of times per day, equal to your proficiency bonus, plus one. And overall, I do like this new ability. Uh, detect Magic is a useful spell, but it's also a spell that, you know, do you want to prepare Detect Magic? Or do you want to prepare something a bit more useful? Then at 3rd level you get your Arcane Tradition, which in 5th edition was at 2nd level. And uh, moving all of the subclasses to level 3 is a 6th edition thing. And uh, this is going to come up again, so I will do my whole thing when that happens. And finally, at levels 4 and 8, you get to increase one of your ability scores by 1 and gain a magic talent, which is what they call feats in this playtest. And just like the fighter, they have included some new and revised talents in this playtest packet, which I will now go over. Mental Fortitude now more clearly states that the reroll on a mental saving throw is used after failing the roll, but before learning the consequences. Mental Prowess lets you increase your Intelligence, Wisdom, or Charisma by 1. Ritualist lets you cast rituals from a specific magic circle. 
and school specialization now specifies that if you take it multiple times, each time you take it, it must be applied to a different school of magic. And that is pretty much it for the base wizard, so now moving on to the arcane traditions, and somewhat of an interesting choice here, it seems they just decided to make up their own arcane traditions instead of trying to adapt the ones from the player's handbook, uh, which were just based on the arcane schools, and let's be honest, aside from like illusionist and necromancer, weren't very interesting. I mean, illusionist wasn't very interesting, but I like the idea of an illusionist and, you know, the history that it has as a class in Dungeons and Dragons. So first up we have the Battle Mage, because I guess War Wizard was just too metal for them, who at level 3 gains access to martial talents in addition to magic ones. Of course, as mentioned earlier, they are also proficient in no weapons, so their martial capabilities are somewhat limited. And also, as I said, a battle mage would be the specific kind of wizard that would have proficiency in that handful of weapons. So, uh, maybe give them proficiency in a handful of weapons. Like, the battle mage specifically, not the wizard overall. I still support the wizard overall having no weapon proficiencies. And then you have Spell Ward, which allows you to, when casting a spell of first ring or higher, yeah, that's a thing I will explain, put up a protective shield, granting you a bonus to AC equal to your proficiency bonus, and resistance to bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing damage, which lasts for one minute or until you end your turn without casting a first ring or higher spell. And then you can use that a number of times per day equal to your proficiency bonus. And... This is one of those things that it's pretty cool in theory, like a meteor version of mage armor, but the duration makes it a little less so. Like, only lasting until such time as you end your turn without casting a level 1 or higher spell pretty much means that most of the time it is going to last for one round. Like, it's a cool thing when you use it, but it seems like the times in which you are going to use it is either A when you are planning on casting several spells in a row, or B, when you specifically assume that you are going to be attacked shortly after casting a spell. And then Tactical Caster, which allows you to exclude yourself and a number of allies from the area of damaging spells. So you no longer have to ask how big the room is before throwing off that fireball. Then at level 7, which is the new 6th edition standard level at which to get a feature from your subtype, you get Contingency Plan, which allows you to, when missing a target with a spell attack, use your reaction to attempt to direct the spell to a second target within range, making a new spell attack roll against the second target. And this one sounds quite convenient. I do like it, because here's the thing with spells... If you cast a spell and an enemy saves against it and takes half damage, you know, that's cool. Uh, they still took some damage. The spell did something. If you cast a spell that the enemy saves against and isn't affected, oh well, no big deal. You know, these things happen sometimes. If you cast a spell and miss the attack roll on the spell, that is very infuriating. <laughs> So being able to have a do-over when you do miss with a spell attack is a pretty nice thing to have. However, as written, it also applies to cantrips, and I'm less sure how I feel about that. Because, like, yeah, it is one of those things that seems like it would be great for the person playing the wizard, but a little annoying to everyone else that they basically get to designate a second target and make a second attack every time they miss. And since there are only eight levels presented in this playtest packet, I probably should have mentioned that earlier, there are only eight levels presented in these playtest packets. Because of that, though, that is it for the Battle Mage, and now move on to the Cantrip Adept, which, according to the little commentary box, is from one of Cobalt Press's previous books, and is included to show how easily 5th edition content can be converted to core fantasy role-playing. Which, uh, I have feelings on, but we'll hold those until later, and we will just look at the archetype for now. 
At third level, Cantrip Adepts get Arcane Alacrity, which allows them to cast a Cantrip with a casting time of action as a bonus action a number of times per long rest equal to your proficiency bonus. And Cantrip Polymath, which allows you to learn two additional Cantrips from any spell circle. And then at level 7, Potent Spellcasting, which allows you to add your proficiency bonus to the damage of Cantrips. So, you know, if you like those Cantrips... Uh, this is a whole thing focused on cantrips. And uh, that is it for, as I said, the limited number of levels presented here. And I do feel like this is a really good example of my biggest overall criticism of this whole thing. One of these arcane traditions is a well-thought-out wizard archetype. Like, I like the battle mage. It's cool. I like seeing different ways in which magic may be practiced by a wizard. That is an interesting way to look at magic users, because, you know, they're not all just going to be like, I'm a transmuter, I'm an evocator, I'm a diviner. No, there are going to be war wizards, there's going to be ships wizards, there's going to be all different kinds of wizards, and that would make wizards significantly less boring. And then the other one is... Just something I guess they kind of had lying around and decided to include as proof of backwards compatibility. Or, you know, maybe they just couldn't think of anything else. And let's be honest here, the Cantrip Adept also just isn't really that interesting. But it seems like the Cantrip Adept, the backwards compatibility, is the thing that they are really highlighting and pushing with this game, not the new original content that they could be making, like the Battle Mage, which, as I said... I liked. But uh, now with the wizard covered, it is time to look at magic, uh, which is directly related to the wizard, as I mentioned previously. So as you may have gathered from context, spell lists are now called spell circles and spell levels are now called rings for some reason. So there are four circles of magic, arcane, divine, primordial, and weird, versus the class-specific spell lists from 5th edition, and if that sounds familiar, it's because that's how it's done in the 6th edition playtest. And mind you, that is a feature of 6th edition that I actually like, but once again brings up the topic that I touched on earlier, and also in the last video. If the primary feature of this system is supposed to be backwards compatibility with 5th edition, that puts it in direct competition with 6th edition, which also claims to be fully backwards compatible with 5th edition. So it seems like they're restricting themselves a lot for that 5th edition backwards compatibility. And if that is the case, their goal should really be to be more backwards compatible with 5th edition than 6th edition. However, there are these little changes they are making that makes it seem like they are also trying to be forwards compatible with 6th edition. And as I've said before, we are currently looking at two playtests for two different revisions of 5th edition. And the more that Project Black Flag takes from 1D&D, the more it just kind of feels like off-brand Dungeons & Dragons. And honestly, if the entire point of this thing is just creating a generic backdoor SRD for 6th edition, they might as well just admit that and stop wasting everyone's time with this playtest. However, if their goal here is making a good game, or at the very least, a better revision of 5th edition, they should really focus on that and not some kind of minor compatibility with the version of Dungeons & Dragons that is not even out yet. Anyway, back to the magic. Uh, of course, the most notable aspect here is the fact that they do have four spell circles instead of the three generic spell lists from the one D&D playtest. They've got the arcane, the divine, and primordial instead of primal, but then also weird, which I do not know what they're going to apply to. My assumption is that it's going to be the spell list for warlocks. However, the way the spell circles work is, uh, if I am reading correctly, not very good. Because the way they are structuring this, the spell circles, you know, they function as spell lists, but seem to be categorized more like spell schools. Like, they provide guidelines for sorting 5th edition spells into the various spell circles. For example, the qualities of an arcane spell are 
The spell detects, suppresses, ends, or otherwise interacts with mechanical aspects of spellcasting. The spell harnesses elemental energy, acid, cold, fire, lightning, or thunder. Or the spell interacts with the five senses, whether to fool them or to extend their capabilities. And then the qualities of a divine spell are... The spell specifically interacts with another creature's life force, whether to heal or harm. The spell harnesses radiant or necrotic energy. And the spell specifies interaction with a deity or includes the word faith in the description. So based on those definitions, Fireball is obviously an arcane spell. It harnesses the elemental energy of fire. But Vampiric Touch is obviously divine now. I mean, it literally deals necrotic damage and heals. That is two things from the Divine Circle and none from the Arcane Circle. And obviously, I'm bringing it up in this very specific manner because it is specifically listed as being an Arcane spell. So they have this whole system for classifying spells that doesn't really apply to the spells listed in this document. And let's just say that hypothetically the spells were properly categorized by these listed qualities. There is very little room for overlap in those descriptions. So most spells would only apply to one circle. So classes with different spell lists would be unlikely to get the same spells. It's one of those things that seems like, oh, this is an interesting idea, but it doesn't really work out. So we just kind of didn't apply it. But, you know, compatibility. You don't really need the spell list, right? You can just use the 5th edition wizard list or the 6th edition arcane list. You know, except for that 4th spell circle. So there isn't really an equivalent there unless it's the warlock spell list. But then in the 6th edition, there is no compatibility for that. You see, my whole point is this thing is just a tangled mess. And it just kind of feels like this half-formed idea dropped on top of the 5th slash 6th edition magic system. Like, kind of saying, here's how magic works, and then it doesn't. But then if they actually did apply the system, it would have effects like making almost every necromancy spell divine and almost every summoning spell weird. But enough on that. As I said, it is basically just like an idea that has implications if it were actually applied, which it isn't. Anyway, as mentioned previously, rituals have now been defined as a separate thing from regular spells, and now that basically includes all spells with a casting time of one minute or longer. Which, I mean, you technically could cast during combat, but the intention was pretty much always that you wouldn't, and now that intention is specified in the rules. So basically, in 5th edition, some spells had a ritual tag, and that meant they could be performed as rituals by increasing the casting time by 10 minutes. And then casting them as a ritual meant that you did not expend a spell slot, and in some cases did not have to have the spell prepared. And then, as I said earlier, any spell with a casting time of 1 minute or longer is now a ritual, with the ritual tag being removed from all spells that do not have a casting time of 1 minute or longer. They still can be cast without expending a spell slot, but also now do not extend the casting time, which is useful for the ones that are uh, 1 minute. And overall, this is a change I like. I like the idea of a spell that you cast like that, and a spell that you cast by getting at a book and drawing a circle on the floor and, you know, doing all that stuff, being separate things. I just wish that they could separate them even more, but they can't without breaking compatibility. Compatibility is the big thing in this game, and that's a bit of a problem. And then giving wizards and possibly other classes extra ritual spell slots is going to encourage players who normally do not take these kinds of spells to do so, because they have the spell slots and they have to take something in them. There have also been a few small changes made to a handful of spells. Comprehend languages and detect magic, as I mentioned earlier, have had their ritual tags removed to be consistent with the new ritual rules. Mage Armor now provides a plus 3 bonus to AC instead of setting your AC to 13 plus your dexterity modifier. And it still lasts for 8 hours, it still only functions when you're not wearing armor, and it is a thing that feels like there should be some kind of functional difference between the two, but I cannot think of one. 
Magic Missile has been rewritten, but I can't really see any difference between the two versions. And they have provided one ritual. This is going to be a funny part of the video. Create Familiar, which is basically find familiar with a few differences. First and least importantly, casting the ritual now reduces your hit point total by one as long as the familiar exists. But the important difference here is that the spell has been completely re-themed. So now it imbues life into an inanimate object to create your familiar instead of summoning a familiar from another plane and also changes the spell's school from Conjuration to Transmutation, and the creature type of your familiar from Celestial, Fey, or Fiend to Construct. And you may have figured it out already, but if not, you may be wondering why they made such an unusually specific change to this specific spell. And of course that is the spell circles, the thing that they pretty much did not apply Anywhere else, they have completely rethemed one spell to fit into because Find Familiar, as it appears, where you summon a familiar from another plane, would definitely go in the Weird Circle. But it needs to be an arcane spell for wizards to have familiars. So, this whole thing they came up with. Didn't apply it anywhere, but then rewrote this one ritual to be applied to it, and it's all just very weird and confusing. And that is pretty much it for changes to the magic system, such as they are. Although I will have to say, I am not 100% familiar with the intricacies of the 5th edition magic system, so there may have been some small changes that I overlooked. And uh, that's it for the Project Black Flag Wizard. And overall, feels kind of half-finished. You have this one pretty good arcane tradition, and then another one that they just kind of dropped in because they had it lying around. And then it feels like they brought up this whole description of this new thematic version of the magic system with, you know, rings and circles and such, but then just kind of didn't apply it except for the one spell that they rewrote to fit into this new system. And I am perhaps being a bit harsh in these videos, I realize that, but a big part of that is it kind of feels like Cobalt Press isn't sure what they are trying to make. Like, it feels like they are trying to ride this middle line between making a game and making a D&D clone, and then hoping that the playtest feedback is going to tell them in which direction they should go. Which is a terrible idea. Because the overall vibe I am getting here is half-formed ideas, half-applied concepts, a thing without a clear design goal. Like, they have a stated design goal of basically being Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition, but then aren't even really sticking too strictly to that. Like, I'm seeing parts of a game that is kinda neat, that I am liking, but then also I'm seeing a lot of a game that I've just seen before because it is Dungeons & Dragons 5th Edition or 6th Edition. And as may be obvious, I'm not incredibly thrilled with the direction that 6th Edition is going in, so I don't really want this to just be another version of 6th Edition. And as I keep saying, they really need to be willing to break compatibility to be something more than just that game that people are vaguely aware of but haven't really looked into because, I mean, it's basically just D&D, &D, right? And D&D &D is D&D &D with brand recognition. Like, Wizards of the Coast has a monopoly on D&D, &D, not because no one's challenged them with a nearly identical game, but because they literally own Dungeons and & Dragons. And like, here's the thing about compatibility is you can completely redesign the classes and retain compatibility with everything except for class features and subclasses. As long as the core mechanics, the way in which the character interacts with the world, you know, hit points, attack bonus, skill bonuses, saves in armor class, etc. 
as long as those things are still there and, you know, basically balanced at the same level, it doesn't matter how you get to those values because the characters will still be able to fight 5th edition monsters. They will still be able to go on 5th edition adventures. They will still be able to cast 5th edition spells. You can literally just replace so much without breaking compatibility with 90% of content. Like, honestly, you could pretty much run a 3rd edition adventure in 5th edition, and it would work. It wouldn't work, like, incredibly well without any modification. There would, of course, be balance issues. But overall, the basic way that the characters mechanically interact with the world hasn't really changed much in the last 20 years. Except for, you know, those four years in the late 20 aughts, early 2010s, uh, which honestly is still quite a bit more compatible than you would expect. But, you know, I will end on a positive here. I will say a positive thing about this playtest uh, because, as I've mentioned multiple times, I am currently looking at these playtests and the 1 D&D playtests, and these playtests are so much better put together. <laughs> Like, they actually do a good job of communicating ideas. They put in design notes to specify what changes have been made and why those changes have been made. And I, you know, would just like to say, yeah, they are doing a good job at presenting something that just kind of feels not great. And I would like to see something that is a lot better, which it feels like they are capable of. And thank you for watching, with extra special thanks to my Fight and Flail Snails, Ranty Maholland, and Toshi Rokuro. If you'd like to be cool like them, you can check out my Patreon, where you can get early access to videos and fun stuff that I make for the Patreon. But if you don't want to do that, that's cool too. You can still hit all the lovely buttons, like, subscribe, these other videos, which either myself or the Cold Heartless YouTube algorithm have lovingly selected for you, which I'm sure are lovely videos that you will also enjoy. And I will see you next time.